Me and Marshall also share our birthdays around Christmas and usually do fun activities. Last year we did shark diving here on Oahu. Every time I begin to think of Marshall, my heart aches and I want my brother to be back with us. Paige didn't even know that her brother was missing until she was called about his truck being found. This is a case that has a lot of bizarre details, a lot of cause for concern, and I want to try to help this family find the answers that they're looking for. It's time to turn on the searchlight for Marshall Iwasa. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. We've got another case we're looking into, this one from our neighbors to the north. This actually takes place in Canada. Let's go ahead and start with the details from the missing poster. This is Marshall Awasa, a 26-year-old male who stands at 5 feet 11 inches tall, weighs 170 pounds, has brown eyes and shoulder-length brown hair. Uh, his sister does describe it also as very curly. He was last seen wearing a green hoodie, a gray toque, that is what us in the U.S. would call a beanie, uh, red high top shoes, and black pants. He was dri driving a dark blue 2009 GMC Sierra with Alberta plates BLL1099. Now, I know I've already told you that the truck has been found. We're going to talk about the condition it's found in, which is a big cause for concern in this. But it's still important that we keep an eye out for anyone that has a memory of this vehicle. Um, I, they're, they're really trying to put together where it has gone and was Marshall with it at that time or not. Uh, so it's very important that we still get the information out about the truck. So once again, that is a dark blue 2009 GMC Sierra with Alberta plates BLL1099. Shoulder length curly brown hair usually tied back. And of course, they have contact information that we'll ha have in the description box below. Uh, on top of that, I know we're covering this in Canada, so just so that we translate this right, um, five feet, 11 inches tall is about 180 centimeters. 170 pounds is 77 kilograms. And this is a picture, I believe, of a similar truck. I don't know if this is the exact truck, um, but this is what we're looking for in terms of possibly footage. Um, if people have cameras along the route that we're going to be talking about in this case, uh, or if you work at a business, particularly a gas station in this area, um, really important that we get that information. Uh, all right, starting at his LinkedIn profile, very simple. We can see that he's a student at Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. Looks like he started there just in 2018. Uh, jumping over to calgary.ctvnews.ca, just a little bit of background on him. Uh, Owasa grew up in Lethbridge where he played high school football and was a member of the Lethbridge Fitness Club. He had been living in Calgary for the past year and a half while attending school at SAIT. He was last seen November 17th by family in Lethbridge. They say he planned to return to his home in Calgary. So essentially, uh, I know that he at least visited with his mother on that day on the 17th. Um, he was on break from school, went and spent some time with his family, and then according to what they thought, he was just driving back to his home that was near school in Calgary. Now we're going to find out his vehicle is found in a much different location than everyone's expecting. But uh, let's go ahead and get to the first mention of the vehicle being found. Burnt out vehicle found. Pemberton RCMP, that's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, is investigating a burnout vehicle that was found at about 1 p.m. on Sunday, November 24th. Police were informed of the abandoned charred pickup found at the trailhead near the Brian Waddington hut. Um, all right, so a couple things. First of all, the, the pickup has been burned. Uh, very big cause for concern. What does that mean? Is someone trying to hide something? We're going to get into all the details about the condition that it's found in. But it's also found on Sunday, November 24th. So we're talking a week after he's last seen. And keep in mind, with what we have going on in this case, he's leaving to go back to school. Uh, he's leaving his family. So, of course, 
they might not be expecting regular contact from him from that point forward. He's going back to school. So that's why at the time of the vehicle being found, uh, I believe there's, there isn't even a missing persons report filed on him yet. No one really knows that he's missing yet. Just all of a sudden, this truck is found. It's been burned. And from that, they uh, kind of backtrace the information and contact the family. Uh, there were possessions thrown all over the area. We're going to get into some of the details of that as well. Police have recovered some of the items in the hopes that they may help identify the truck's owner. However, given its condition, location, and time of year, that will prove challenging, the release went on. Um, time of year. We're talking Canada in um, November. I've looked into some of the weather around there just to get a sense of what would it take to actually light this truck on fire, and especially to the extent that it burnt. And I'm just very curious about would there be an accelerant involved? If there is, where does that come from? Did someone stop at a gas station to buy some canisters of gasoline? How, did, how does this fire exactly happen? Um, we'll get into all that. Continuing with another article at Penticton Now, the truck is believed to belong to 26-year-old Marshall Owasa. The discovery of the burned 2009 GMC Sierra in BC was reported to Owasa's family, resulting in the family reporting the man as missing to CPS. And I do believe it's his sister that actually reported it. Um, another thing that's uh, concerning here is the truck is actually found in British Columbia, which is the next province over. Um, him and his family are from Alberta. So we're talking a pretty pretty good amount of travel that is going on before this truck is dumped at that area. Uh, let's go ahead and bring up a map real quick so we can just take a look. Lethbridge, this is where he was visiting with his family. Calgary, where he's going to school. And then we have Pemberton, way out here in British Columbia. And we're talking um, from Lethbridge to Calgary, I think is less than a few hundred miles. Um, if I remember right, it's like maybe a two, two and a half hour drive. And then from Calgary out to Pemberton, we're talking hundreds of miles, like maybe another um, 500 miles or so. And just so that we're doing this right for everyone that could be watching, the total route we're talking from Lethbridge to Calgary and from Calgary to Pemberton is over a thousand kilometers. Now, what that certainly had me thinking right off the bat when I'm looking into this is, someone's stopping for gas. And I don't know if we're talking about a situation where something has happened to him, someone has him under control or something like that, and they're stopping for gas, or if this is him. If he, if he decided for some reason he didn't want to go back to school and he was going to drive off to the west, I don't know. But one way or another, this truck is being refueled. And then, of course, we have that question about is there an accelerant that's being used for where is it for where it actually is found? And if so... Not only is the truck being refueled, but there might be additional canisters that are purchased along the way as well. Continuing over at CISNFM.com, let's dive into some details here from the people that actually found the truck. Owasa's pickup truck was found Saturday by a group of hikers who had set out to visit the remote Brian Waddington hut north of Pemberton, BC. So it's not in Pemberton proper. It's actually... Um, from what I understand, you have to go four by fouring for a while. And then I think you even have to hike beyond that um, to get to where this hut is. Uh, Google won't even run a map to get you to the Brian Waddington hut. It won't even run a walking map to get you to the Brian Waddington hut. So that tells me that um, for some reason, the trails aren't registered with Google's information at all. Um, but also just kind of makes it interesting to me in terms of if, if you are looking at this as a potential crime, a dumping spot, you've gotten it off the highway, you've gotten it out of town, it's at a location where ultimately it takes hikers to be able to find it. Um, so could that mean that someone was trying to hide the location of the truck? Possibly. Let's continue with the article. At the trailhead, we came across a pickup truck that had been completely torched, but it looked like it had been torched, you know, extremely aggressively, James Stark said. I mean, the glass was melted when the wheels had been blown off, like it was completely destroyed. Um, so once again, just leading me to believe we're, we're talking about some accelerant being used here. And here is the first photo that you can see of the truck. I mean, the thing is seriously 
um, seriously torched. The paint is all just about completely melted off. None of the glass is in place anymore. Everything on the interior, even the dashboard, everything is completely melted all over the, the place. This thing got extremely hot in, I don't want to say questionable weather. It was certainly possible, obviously, but uh, in some challenging weather circumstances. Um, Stark and his hiking companions found two passports scattered around the scene. One was Awasa's expired passport. The other had the pages with identifying information torn out. Kind of strange to me that you would have uh, the passports actually outside of the truck. I mean, if you are trying to hide the identity of this vehicle and who it belonged to, why are you going to take items with recognizable information like that and remove them from the vehicle that is obviously being torched? I really don't get that. But then take the effort of actually removing some pages with identifying information from one of the passports, but then not the other. A lot of strangeness that's going on with this. Very hard to comprehend. And of course, understanding the intent of what's going on here could be helpful in terms of trying to find the truth. And it's really tough to understand the intent when you have these kind of logically conflicting points that are going on. Uh, the group also found three smashed cell phones, a smashed laptop, PlayStation, and Xbox, as well as clothing and toiletries. Um, so a lot of people in the discussion boards are keying into the three smash cell phones. I saw one comment that actually seems to make some sense. Uh, you know, he is going to school for technology. Could it be that he is into developing apps? Could it be that the phones are part of uh, his curriculum in some way or that he uses those for testing apps? I think certainly possible. Um, some people do have multiple cell phones. Uh, so that is also possible. I think People are dancing around that because some people are trying to consider, was he in some type of other business, some illegal business or something with, with using these other cell phones? I think there's a lot of very reasonable explanations for people to have multiple cell phones nowadays, personally. Um, but we're talking the cell phones, the laptop, the PlayStation, and Xbox. What is clear is this is certainly not a robbery attempt. Everything of value is being destroyed and left at the scene, including his truck. Um, so I think we can pretty much scratch off robbery as a motive with whatever is going on here. Uh, he went on to say the scene looked as if someone was trying to dispose of evidence. And of course, this is um, Stark, the guy that actually found the um, truck out there with his four friends. Uh, but then again, it didn't really make a lot of sense because you think, okay, if you're trying to get rid of evidence, wouldn't you just burn it all in the truck rather than cast it all around the area? Uh, I totally agree with him. That thought came to me as soon as I started seeing these pictures as well and hearing this, these details about the items being outside of the truck. Uh, as a matter of fact, the aspect of having one of the passports taken out and then the pages ripped would kind of make sense because what if you were afraid of leaving that in the truck and it not burning completely and then them obviously finding it very quickly and being able to identify the person very quickly. So that one kind of makes sense, but then you've got the expired passport where they left his information in. That doesn't make sense. The Xbox, the PlayStation, is this, I don't know, I'm just I'm asking you guys, does this feel like rage to you? Is someone mad at him or is it him mad at himself? Something along those lines. Um, why are these items being smashed up all around the vehicle while the vehicle is being burnt? I mean, if you want to destroy them, just leave them in the vehicle. And honestly, I mean, yes, I know police could certainly take a PlayStation or an Xbox and then backtrace that information and discover someone's identity. But um I don't know. I don't know what it just feels very strange to me that you have the items removed from the fire. I mean, if you were that concerned, take them out, smash them and then throw them back in while it's burning. And that way you would be relatively certain. But we don't really have that happening either. So whatever's happening here is extremely haphazard. I don't know that it's very well thought out. Um, something that keeps popping up in my mind is the possibility of like, uh, a hitchhiker or something, you know, was there someone that came along for the ride with him and then something went wrong with them? Um, it just, it doesn't feel like it's very well thought out in terms of what's going on here. seems like there's some emotional aspect at play. And like I said, I just, I don't know if it's someone else angry at him and angry at his possessions and destroying all that. 
uh, or possibly even if it's it's him. Uh, I can tell you guys from the information I'm seeing, the family does not seem to have any information supporting that he would do this of his own accord. They seem very concerned. I think they have a, a huge right to be concerned. Uh, you've got the vehicle found in this condition. We don't know where he is. He's missing for coming up on a month at this point. That's a big part of why I wanted to do this video at this time, because I know a lot of digital recorders uh, will start writing over information at about a month. Sometimes it happens even sooner, but I'm hoping that we get this video out, get some more eyes and ears on this. And if you do live in the area, if you've got cameras that face that, please either stop them from overwriting or at least check that footage uh, within the next week before it's likely to be overwritten. So here's the exterior of the truck. And you can see this, this fire got going. Um, and that just really makes me think back to how do you get a fire going like this? I looked at the temperatures for this whole week and it's basically kicking around freezing this whole week. Uh, the highest it gets on one day is, I believe it was 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but even the low end was still dipping to uh, below freezing temperature. Uh, that's, uh, I guess, about uh, eight degrees Celsius or, of course, you know, freezing at zero. Um, but the other days were considerably cooler. Uh, and we don't really know which day this fire occurred. Um, but I'm, I'm really curious that we're not hearing more from the authorities in terms of them looking at how this fire was done. Uh, did they find any canisters nearby that might make sense for you know an accelerant that was used on the outside of this to get it going? Um, were there any items that were pulled into the vehicle to help the vehicle burn in some way? We're not getting any of those types of details, unfortunately. But back to the group that found the truck, unsettled, they drove back to an area with cell phone service and called Pemberton RCMP. Another important point there, um, because they don't have cell phone service. So even if we do look at his GPS information or try to do ping trails on him, um, you're gonna bump into a problem probably once he gets off that main road and starts going up into the wilderness here. They don't have cell phone service, so I doubt that his phone, one of his three phones, uh, stayed connected at that point. It's possible. I mean, if he's on a different carrier, I, I hope they're pulling that information. Unfortunately, we're not hearing about any of that here, but uh, if I was the family, I would certainly be asking um, the police that are working on this to check his GPS information, check the cell phone towers. Uh, if I was the family, I'd probably even be trying to log into any Google accounts uh, that he might have and looking at the Google location history for myself, if possible. We have heard about other families in this position doing that as well. Uh, let's continue at bc.ctvnews.ca. This is a, a, a freeze frame from a video clip of him with his sister. Uh, a little more information about the guys that found it. James Stark and four friends were planning to spend the weekend at the Brian Waddington hut, but when they got to the trailhead, they came across a gutted vehicle. Honestly, at first it's confusion, he said in an interview with CTV News. Are we in danger? Is there someone out there? You start wondering if something nefarious had taken place, he said. I mean, it was almost unidentifiable. The last we heard, he was going back up to Calgary, his sister Paige Fogan said. Maybe there was something in BC that I had no clue about or something that just came up for him. But as far as I know, there really wasn't much in BC for him. Um, she's also making great points here. If they were able to get into his email uh, or access at least some of his phone information through the phone company, could they perhaps see phone calls that he's making to someone maybe that lives out in that area? Um, if they can get into his email, are there messages? If they can get into his social media, is he communicating with anyone out out there. There should be a pretty good uh, digital investigation, I would say, going on around this case. I would like to think there is. Uh, just once again, we're not hearing about these details, at least through the media. Page said Owasa loved the outdoors and hiking, but it would be weird if he went to, on a hike in BC without telling anyone. This is out of character for him, she said. Fogan is the one who reported him missing. The car being found the way it was found is quite concerning, she said. Uh, who couldn't agree with that? Uh, there are many different options as to what could have happened here, said Sergeant Rob Napton. Napton confirmed the two passports found belonged to Owasa, but that one of them had expired. 
So it seems like even though the pages were pulled out, there was still some information where they could trace that passport, and that one actually wound up belonging to him as well. We've conducted several searches up in the area, he said. We were up there with our Pemberton search and rescue. We've been up there with our police dogs, as well as used helicopters with our search as well. The Brian Waddington hut where Stark and his friends were going to stay requires an online registration, but no one was supposed to be up there other than his group. Uh, he does say, sometimes people would go up without registering, of course, if they're not aware, but at that point in time, there was no one registered when we wanted to go up. And I just, I really appreciate that uh, he's trying to be helpful and really help the family with information like that. Um, it's just, you know, it, it's great when you have a community kind of rally around to help a family that's in a situation like this. Let me just tell you guys, there is a Facebook page for this and it, it moved me to see the amount of support that the family is getting there. Not only that, but it's one of the best find a missing person Facebook pages that I've seen. The moderators are just doing a great job. Community, extremely supportive. Um, very, very moving. You know, I'm always looking for the bright spots in this story. Quite honestly, that Facebook page is one of them. And you guys should probably check it out for yourself. If you live in the area and you can possibly help with putting up posters uh, or any search efforts that might come up, please follow that Facebook page. It's definitely worth the time. Um, back to the article, his sister adds, uh, he's also got broad shoulders, and you can see in this photo here, uh, he's got long hair, it's quite curly. He does usually wear it pulled back in a bun or under a toque or beanie. We're all really, really worried, and we're really hoping that we can find him soon and get him home safe. The family has spoken uh, in several different places about how supportive the community is. What about their relationship with law enforcement? Here at CalgarySun.com, we get a little insight there. The sister of a missing Calgary man says family members are working closely with police to search for answers in his disappearance. We don't have a lot of information at this point, said Paige. Uh, Paige described her brother as very athletic and as someone who likes outdoor activities, including hiking and camping. I live in Honolulu and we frequently, every time he's down, we'll go on lots of different hikes and he's a very avid outdoors person and hiker, she said. Um, so for me, I'm wondering about that because of the location where the truck is found. Uh, seems to suit that part of his personality. Does he know about that location? Um, was he maybe planning a trip there that he wasn't telling his family about for some reason? or? I don't know if it was normal for him to do things like that without telling his family he was going to do something like that. But it's just um, pretty curious that, and if you look through photos, uh, you can see he's certainly an outdoorsy person. He certainly likes being in nature. Um, so for his vehicle to be found there in, in that type of location in particular really uh, makes me think. He might be out there and he might be hurt or scared or lost, and he might not ask for help, she added. He's very independent. He usually will keep to himself and he might just try to get through it thinking that he's okay and he can make it. Of course, as we get more into winter, um, weather becomes more and more of a concern here. Not to mention, I don't know what items he might have taken with him to help him survive in the wilderness, if that's truly what we have going on here. You know, we're hearing that clothing is left behind, toiletries are left behind. So um, I'm a little concerned about that aspect as well. Over at calgary.ctvnews.ca, family continues to hold out hope. This is po posted on December 2nd, 2019. RCMP say they have received a number of tips in the disappearance of Marshall Owasa. Certainly good to hear. Uh, they don't really share any information about those tips, but I'm glad that at least some are being called in. Uh, search crews and a helicopter were used this past weekend to scour the area once again, but without success, unfortunately. Lethbridge News Now has done some coverage on this case as well. Uh, in this article, they're mentioning that the public Facebook group has been started as part of the effort to find him. Posters bearing Owasa's photo and information have been set up in areas of Lethbridge and Pemberton. Some community members have also resorted to changing their Facebook profile photos to a missing person image of the 26-year-old. I saw a lot of people that had done that um, that were commenting on the Facebook group. So obviously their personal profiles, they've been changing to his missing poster. 
with today's social media, it's been great. We've seen it everywhere from Facebook, Instagram, VSCO, Snapchat. Everybody is posting about it, trying to spread awareness, said Owasa's cousin, Alexis. That's another big reason why I'm doing this story today. I looked on YouTube and saw only one other video about this case. It was only a few minutes long and uh, just had some of the details from one of the articles. So I'm hoping you guys will help me spread the awareness and maybe we can get that tip called in that will give this family the answers that they're looking for. Uh, let's continue back the article. Just the last about year and a half, he's been going to SAIT, taking some schooling there, but he usually did try to come back down to Lethbridge every weekend or so whenever he had the availability. Our family is really close, so whenever we had big dinners or like a special occasion, everybody was always there. That's just another comment from his cousin about him. Obviously, you can see this family is really missing him. Over at globalnews.ca, posted December 4th, 2019, Marshall Awas's family was in the middle of ramping up a social media and poster campaign when they received word police suspended their search for the 26-year-old. You're just sad because you love him and it hurts and you want him back home, uh, Jackie Darmanin, Awas's cousin, told Global News. Whistler RCMP Sergeant Rob Napton said subsequent searches led to the discovery of discarded clothing by a creek, but underwater searches found nothing else. Them finding a trail of items leading to a water source, certainly another big cause for concern. Um, but essentially, we have them saying that, hey, look, we've searched, we can't find him, and you know we're stopping the search effort at this point. What's really tough about that for me looking into this case is just realizing someone was there. If it was him or if it was someone else, someone lit up the truck, someone damaged all those items, someone left that trail of clothing leading to that water source. Um, and the fact that you haven't found that person is it, it's a, it's a problem because you know, someone was in that area and especially it'd be different for me if like the trail of clothing led back to a road or back to some other means of, or reasonable mean of, of transportation, um, leading to a water source doesn't exactly sound like that. Uh, and if we are talking about a recovery effort, I'm just, I, I imagine it's really tough for the family to hear that you know they're they're essentially stopping the search. I'm sure the weather's starting to get uh, starting to play a factor in that as well. But let's continue with the article uh, with a really interesting point from Napton. We believe that he was likely the driver. There was some personal effects around in the area, but there's nothing to suggest there was anything suspicious that occurred. Now, I would really like to know the logic behind why they think he was likely the driver. We know he's coming back from spending a weekend with his family. For him to have his laptop, his Xbox, his cell phones, his PlayStation, uh, clothing, toiletries, all of that makes sense. From what I understand, I think he was taking a week off that he was spending time down with his family. So of course he's gonna have those kind of items. So finding those types of personal items, even including his passports around the vehicle, for me personally, isn't enough to come to the conclusion that he was probably the driver. His items were already in the vehicle. We already know that. So if someone else took the vehicle, those items would still be with it. So I would like to think Napton has some other reason to believe that. Uh, unfortunately, we just don't get it through media. His cousin also added, there were no indications he was going through a difficult time, wanted to get away or harm himself. None of it makes any sense, she said. Why would he have done that? Why would anyone have done that? It's a really, really good question. Uh, we're trying to reach communities in the smaller areas in between, anywhere he might have stopped, stayed someplace, bought gas. Uh, Whistler RCMP said they will reassess on a day-to-day -day basis if new information is brought forward. If that's the case, next steps could include bringing in search dogs or holding off until the spring. So certainly a little indicator there that weather is becoming a, an issue here. Um, I also just wanted to say at this point, if you have information about this case that can help this family, please do the right thing. Please use those contact details in the description box below and send it in. My family doesn't really have ties to BC. We don't go there typically, so that's why it's concerning, said his sister, Paige. There's lots of stations they could have stopped to fuel up. I mean, my brother's truck goes through quite a bit of gas, and to get into that area, Pemberton, is quite far, so they would have had to fuel up for gas. 
and from what I understand, the family is focusing on contacting gas stations on that route. I think that's an excellent idea, asking them to review footage, seeing if they could find that truck. Um, his sister says her family is relying on the public to jog their memory to see if they've seen Owasa or his truck after November 17th. Really, call their RCMP or call their local police and help us kind of track and see where Marshall was or where his truck was. Um, definitely the best thing the family can be doing right now, and I'm so glad to see that they're um, approaching it from that way. Over at Lethbridge News Now, officers also recovered personal documents, cell phones that had been destroyed, a laptop that was also destroyed, a path of clothes that were partially burned, as if that person may have caught on fire when the vehicle was burning. Napton says RCMP also conducted several searches in the area in conjunction with Pemberton Search and Rescue using helicopters, dogs, and teams of people. Most recently, we also brought in an underwater search team to search a creek that was nearby in the direction the clothes were going. So, I mean, yes, I, I know it's tough when you hear that the search is off, but it really sounds like they pulled out the right resources, uh, at least for where the information was leading them. It's just unfortunate they haven't picked up on that next thing to take them to the next step of figuring out where he is. The Owasa family is hoping to trigger someone's memory or to encourage people to look at their security footage. Owasa's sister Paige sent a statement. Police have investigated Marshall's accounts, and I don't believe there are any leads at this time. I don't think there is any reason to vanish. We are very close, and I can't imagine him doing this. Given the condition and circumstances in which his truck was found, I'm extremely concerned for him and feel it's suspicious. I don't believe he just chose to vanish, and I'm worried about him and his safety. Now, what does the RCMP think? Over at the Squamish Chief, uh, we have no idea where he could be, said Whistler RCMP Sergeant Rob Napton. Basically, we've exhausted the search efforts in the area we know he was in, and there's nothing else to suggest other locations to look at. Napton did say police believe Iwasa was likely the driver of the truck and that he may have left on foot. We found some clothing indicating the direction of travel, he added. Napton also said there is nothing to suggest that there has been any foul play. Having said that, everything is always an option until it's disproven. Um, in a lot of other cases I've looked at before, when you have a vehicle that's been burned like this, it's usually to cover up some type of evidence that is involved with a foul play situation. So I understand why it's uh, particularly tough for the family to hear this. I'm not saying that's what's happening here necessarily, um, but it does happen a lot. So I'm kind of curious to see, you know, a, a sergeant with the RCMP saying that, hey, you know, we basically we don't have anything that's telling us there's foul play. Well, kind of. You got, you know, a lot of personal effects that have been damaged. You've got a vehicle that has been completely torched. What is the reason for that vehicle being burnt? That's really uh, the question in this case. If it is to cover up evidence, uh, you, you won't know if there's foul play or not. I mean, you saw the interior and exterior of that thing. Anything that was in it was was gone. Uh, thankfully, they didn't find any remains, which, you know, we've looked at cases where that has also been the outcome. Uh, let's continue at globalnews.ca. Mother of missing Calgary man speaks out after RCMP search suspended. This is posted December 6th, 2019, and this is a shot of his mother. The last time Tammy Johnson saw her son Marshall Owasa was on November 17th when he stopped by her home in Lethbridge to help fix her computer. We talked and everything was normal, Johnson said Friday. Nothing was out of sorts. None of this makes any sense. All we have are questions. We have no answers. He had to have stopped for gas, she said. His truck had to have stopped for gas. I'll put it that way. Someone else has to have seen him. Uh, I think she's making an important clarification there that um, if someone else did something to him and then took his vehicle, it might not be him that we're looking for at those gas stations. So I really hope that uh, when they are contacting the gas stations, they're trying to get people to focus on the truck. You know, check that surveillance footage for the truck. And then when you see a truck that matches the description, you know, then take it from there to, okay, let's see the people that are associated to that vehicle. Um, Cause who knows, we really don't know enough about this situation to know for certain that he is on that trip all the way out to Pemberton. Um, 
there, there's a lot of different things that could be going on here. So I've already told you about it, but once again, please follow the Facebook page. Please help them raise awareness to this case as well. Also have a few other links down below to conversation threads that are going on, one at crimewatchers.net about this case, and of course over at Web Sleuths. Let's talk about this case in the comments down below. I ask that we please remain respectful to the family. Um, it's pretty rare nowadays that I put out a video and the family doesn't see it. So uh, we want to we can talk about anything, but let's just remember to be respectful about the theories and thoughts that we share down there uh, and really use that space for good ideas. That's what a case like this really needs. Is there any aspects that you think could be investigated differently? Any tools that the family can use? Uh, speaking of which, any family members or friends that do see this, there's a link in the description box below to a missing person tips page that I've put together. All the best information I can find on handle when you have a missing loved one. So uh, there might be some ideas in there that could be helpful. But from what I can see on the Facebook page, a lot of the best ideas from that page are already being used by the friends and family searching for him. So um, I just got to say my heart goes out to Marshall's family uh, and his sister has been doing such a good job raising awareness. Uh, she's really, uh, she's popping up in all the articles. She's putting out the videos. She's doing all the work. Uh, they just need help. Someone else out there has some information for them and we need to get that to them. So once again, if you're that person, please use the contact details that you'll find down below. Before I end today's episode, I need to thank several new patrons. A big thank you to Luis P., Lindsay Morgan, Maddie Woywode. Hope I'm saying that right, Maddie, and Danielle. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. If you'd like to do the same, you can do that over at www.lordandarts.com. You can sign up for PayPal, sign up for Patreon, buy merchandise. All of it helps keep me here doing what I love doing, spending time with you guys, and helping these families in need. Take care, everyone. I'll see you back here on Friday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch on the Lord and Arts channel. <laughs>